couple of things I was going to say. Um, like Rod, my background is insurance, and I think it's an incredible training ground because you get very used to filling in forms, which makes you ask a lot of questions. So it kind of becomes ingrained in you that you need to get all of this information. Um, one of the things that I then had to do was learn how to negotiate with people in difficult situations. And one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given is when you're talking to somebody is look for like external clues as to how you can get into their world. So just silly things like if they've got photographs on the wall of a family or children or a particular ornament or anything that's in their environment that you can comment on that then, you know, you can, oh, that's a nice painting or whatever. And it just kind of brings you into their world rather than, uh, and even if you're not remotely interested in whatever it is, it just gives you something that you can kind of hang that conversation on. Yeah. I used to do that instinctively walking into a salon. I would never give false praise, but I was looking, I'd be looking for something uh, that, and I'd be looking for something in the conversation that we had in common. Uh, usually the default was the accent. Cause I'm aware coming from Manchester of an accent and I don't think I've got an accent now, but, uh, but I, so those things in common, both what you see and what you hear, et cetera. Uh, if you suddenly discover somebody's a uh, Manchester United supporter, then uh, then that's absolutely brilliant. In fact, I met somebody in Wells that uh, lived in Blackburn. So I was able to relate the fact that my father and all my uh, people on my male side were uh, all from Accrington. So Issa, you must use the, the questioning uh, approach uh, I don't know about legally, but I would think out of any any professionalism, you you you've got to uh, really delve into somebody's situation before you can prescribe yeah. the right exercise. Yeah, so I think one of the things that I often try and do is when I'm gathering data or information and finding out what it is they really want, what their pain point is, is I also like to know what it is they do, um, so their job or um you know where they are what they're used to doing in their usual things so if they're kind of a computer or um a secretary or used to organizing things then i like to use because that's in their everyday experience i like to then transfer those skills and then get them to understand well that thing that you normally do with an office or as an engineer and then try and get them to kind of see how those skills can be adapted to help them become more aware of understanding how their body moves and how everything is interrelated. So I find then you're in their territory, you're in their everyday world, and then they can understand it a little bit more. So I'm then kind of talking in their language. I think also if you're providing, uh, if you're asking the questions and, they're probably wondering why you're asking the questions and then maybe you're describing why that's important. You're, when you're educating somebody, you're actually helping them and people are drawn to people that help them. Yeah. You're and I also, think the, You're also showing that interest as well. Yeah. I think the other thing that um, quite often I get is people have, they've told their stories before in whatever different way um, and but often by the time they come to me, they've told it to quite a few people, but nobody appears to either be listening or if they're listening, they don't get what they're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's that idea or not idea. It's the, the fact that um, everything is so interrelated. And for me, um, it's like, you know, I did this and I think because I'm feeling A, B and C, that means E, F, G. And when they've said that to either the doctor or the physio, they kind of just get that either fob off or no response. And I'm like, well, that makes sense to me. And then I go to explain why it makes sense to me or if I'm getting them to. Um, so it's that validation. Yeah. Validating that their experience is important and that you are going to take that into account to make sure that you can deliver an alternative to what else has been delivered to them before, which hasn't been appropriate or hasn't worked. 
Also, I think that in this conversation, when you are when you're getting you're receiving the information, you're interpreting that and feeding it back because you may be misinterpreting it. So that's when the other person is going to say, no, actually, I, I think I've described that wrong, etc. Uh, and ah, now I get it. So really, you know, these this this is really the, the, what we want to go forward. Anybody, mm -hmm. anybody else has got any? How do people? How does everybody feel about this? This it's a consultation process. Uh, the whole sales process. Uh, Ollie. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I find this interesting because I think because I tend to work with a lot of um, sort of sole traders or very small businesses they're quite um cautious about how they spend their money so there tends to be this kind of very long process and it was interesting i think before you said that there is i think it was seven touch points yeah. you said before a kind of like a sale is almost made and some of what the clients i've kind of worked with you know 10 20 emails later and then there might be a couple of months where i don't hear from them and then all of a sudden out of the blue it kind of pops up and you hear and, and it's brilliant but um yeah, I do find that can be um, quite time consuming to just, and it is that um, sort of reassurance, I think, that you said, giving the client the kind of confidence in your ability and um, reassuring them and answering questions generally. Um, and I often find it's more, I think, maybe the, the client seems to come with a lot of questions themselves rather than having to ask huge amounts about them, about um, them to get the questions out of them. Um, but I do find one of the things is that, which I do get stuck on, is when the client, certain clients, and it's particularly when it comes to SEO and things like that, that they are kind of, they're happy with that, with how it is. And so they don't, they kind of think, oh, you know, I've, I've got a nice stream of work. I don't need to get any more, more in. And it's trying to find a way and uh, to then say, actually, you know, maybe that work's not always going to be there for them and this is why it's important. So I found, yeah, that bit has been quite interesting so far. Right. Um, just as an aside, the, the, if you imagine 82% of sales take place over the seven touch, you've got to, you've got to question, why is that? Well, first of all, mainly it's timing. Secondly, it could be, they don't really know you and they've only ever, you've only ever called once and 24 hours later, Sorry to say, they've forgotten you. Mm. As life goes on, uh, there's no real relationship or trust. They don't know how competent you are. So, um, but timing isn't much to do with anything. And the good thing is that you just stay in touch, find ways to stay in touch. And it doesn't have to be labor intensive. You can set systems up to do that. Then, um, then it helps in that whole process, you know? Um, and also, it preserves your mental state because if you think that everybody you speak to for the first time, you should have a sale, you'll get very frustrated because the majority, if you're doing some really good, strong lead generation, the majority of people are going to say no the first time by default. And if you're hanging on that role, you need, I, I used to say to sales teams, do not become attached to the, uh, to the answer. Don't become attached to it. When somebody decides to go ahead, don't become too attached to that. Um, be attached to what people do, not what they say they'll do. Uh, Nick, you had your hand and then Martin, uh, and then Andrew. Yeah, I just wanted to build on, I think Ollie makes a really good point there. It's, I think when I first started out, a bit like you just described, Paul, you, you, you see a kind of positive indication from someone and you can kind of get, wow, I'm going to make a sale here, and you get too keen. And if you get too keen, you, you kind of scare them off or you just become too pushy and you know they, they walk away. It's, it's not a great way to build a relationship, isn't it? But I think as you as you build more confidence, you can then pull back and relax. And as you said, Paul, if you can keep, it's finding a way to keep giving that value, isn't it? So you can drip feed it in in a very natural way um, without being pushy at all. Um, well, but it's a lot more difficult than <laughs> than you describe. I think it's um it, it's a real skill. I think the um, I think it is it is and it's a skill that we need to develop and, and it's developed over time. I know that I'm enthusiastic by nature and when I'm uh, when I get really enthusiastic about something, even and it, it's not other the other person can feel that as pushy. So tonality and the way we talk to people and the way we uh, interact 
it's it's not too good to get overexcited. Great, I've got a sale. I'll say, oh no, sorry, you changed your mind. <laughs> Martin. Yeah, just a couple of points from my experience. Um, one, I'm you know, I really enjoy chatting to people, but um I just carry on chatting and I never really, never really kind of you, you don't know where you're going with it or when when to sort of say actually are you interested and also um yeah I get I get hung up by one lead and so what I'm understanding now is just this idea of just getting many leads you know I get very sort of thinking into like one possibility and um you know I'm understanding that's uh, not a great great thing to do I think I, I'm a, I always picture the the uh, hawk that is just seen that mouse, that harvest mouse in the field, and he's hovering there, and that's the only mouse he sees. And then he'll just hover and hover, and you're waiting for the mouse to move, and then he'll go down and swoop in and grab it. And uh, that can be a bit soul-destroying, and that can actually stop any momentum, uh, that's for sure. The fact is, the more leads, the uh, appropriate leads you get through the system, the more, by default, you'll get the sales. It can give people that are the creative, so they've only got a certain amount of time, a bit of a challenge, but it's a nice challenge to have, um, to be saying to somebody, look, I, I'll be able to fit you in, in in three months' time or whatever. It depends on your business, of course. Rob's not able to do that. Um <laughs> <laughs> but uh, wait, I'm just interested, and then I'll come to Andrew. I'm just interested. I pick up on what people say. You say, uh, I like chatting to people. What do you mean by that? Is it you talking or them or whatever? And if you then said, I'm not sure sometimes where it's going, what do you mean by you chatting to people? Um, what I mean is I'm, I'm, I think I'm quite good at asking questions about them and interested in what they do in their life and you know, so I have a, a very good conversation. It's usually all about them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're sort of knowing, yeah, developing that skill to know when to turn it. And you some, Right. And sometimes that you've got them talking, you've done a good job, and they're all over the place because they think it's about a chat. I, you know, that can happen. That can happen. And by the way, if it happens and you lose it, just, just enjoy it. Remember, eight touches. If it's only served to fill in a touch and you can come back another day, uh, you know, in, in that situation. Uh, I'm going to do Andrew and then I'm going to get Zoe, sir. Yeah, just to say what pick up on what Mars was saying, I think I used to be like that. So you tend to be, especially starting out, every, and, and every leader is absolutely precious, but if you've only got the one, you can become very fixated on that. It becomes incredibly precious and then that puts a lot of pressure on you. And then you can sort of oversell and things like that. So, you know, many leads is the way to go. But the main point I was going to make from, from a little while back was um, one of my best clients. Um, I remember when I, I she, she was a referral from a very trusted source. And we spoke a couple of times on the phone. This was pre-pandemic. And she never said as much, but I just got the sense that she wanted to meet. And she was over in Cardiff and I'm in Bristol. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to go and meet her. And... I could just sense it, and we did. I, I drove to Cardiff, uh, met up with her for a coffee. Um, we got on really well, and she's one of my best clients. You know, about shadow of the day, fantastic. So sometimes I think you've got to feel, and obviously if you're prepared to do that as well, and I really was, um, but that doesn't matter. If they were up in Manchester or somewhere like that, I probably wouldn't drive to Manchester. But, <laughs> you, could <laughs> ask, these days. but you could ask them to drive to you. This is true. It's a good qualification. <laughs> we'll meet halfway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um zoe sir, and then rebecca yeah so one of the things that i think i found really useful with regards to the whole process is also realizing that whilst there the touches are important equally it's my opportunity to actually work out do i really want to work with you yeah and that's yeah. that's not i think because i've run my own business and initially always been in that you know you've got to work with this you've got to you know get the money in say yes to everybody and then as you grow and kind of find your feet then there comes a point where you're like well actually there are certain people that I don't want to work with and so making sure that you use those touch points in that conversation to 
weedle out the people that you don't want to work with is equally important and actually if you can recommend them to someone else then when they're ready or at that point where you can work with them then that's a possibility or you've also it's still good feedback if you're like oh they couldn't work with me but actually they did steer me in a good direction I think the temptation when we are new in business or we we just need the business that we take it but then we've all had clients we really could do without because they give us the most pain they make us the least amount of money and Andy's <laughs> nodding there and uh, that's absolutely so right I'm looking to build uh, this uh, a team of people in this weight weight management and funny enough I was on a call yesterday and they were talking about how important it was to really pre-qualify people you're going to work with whether they're whether you're going to pay them or when you're not going to pay them uh, because they can really drag you down uh, you can you can really feel God, I've, I've got to have a meeting with so-and-so, and that can sap your energy. Uh, Zoisa and then uh, Anne-Marie. Uh, sorry, Rebecca. Rebecca and then Anne-Marie. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, it was about... Um, oh. Um, oh, yeah, often just thinking about clients. Um, you're told to picture your ideal clients, aren't you? And to, like, make a sort of describe what they're like but actually I think it's more useful to to really think about each client as so unique and individual because their personality how they work how they operate um that's what will build your relationship so I think focusing you're often asked to focus a lot on your ideal client but actually if you just think about the people you do come into contact with and what they're like that's going to you know, then you'll build relation, genuine relationships and absolutely, and stop assuming things or jumping. It will. Well, it's just like, yeah. you know, that, that interaction with that person, the person, first of all, is a human being. Yeah. And, uh, so that's why I relate is business is all about relationships, really. Mm. Um, Anne-Marie. Um, yeah, I was going to say as well, I think it's about, looking it's about self-reflection and it's about understanding yourself so that you can then understand others which sounds a bit woo woo but I guess what I mean is for me for example I know that once I've got interest from somebody I'm absolutely fine I can talk I can ask questions I can listen I can empathize and you know generally speaking we get we get to the end result my issue is getting those people through the door in the first place it you know the lead generation it's actually finding those people to have the conversations with and for me it's kind of it's just been a journey of recognizing that that's my weakness and working out how to build that into my whole sales process um as well does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely no worry. Yeah. Anybody yeah it's getting those people getting in front of those people so that you can have that conversation that yeah that is tricky i made a couple of notes here and i think it was inspired by Anne marie and rod um sometimes when we are knowing what information we need to gather knowing what questions we need to ask uh it's as well to write those down um and rehearse them and the you can rehearse them live or you can just keep going through them, but actually writing them down um, on a form uh, or in a notepad, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And I know when, uh, because we're in a business situation and I'm used to, I mean, coming from a corporate point of view, I'm used to somebody taking notes, etc. It always used to amaze me at networking meetings, at B&I meetings, how many people would have their breakfast, would sit and listen, and I'm thinking, goodness me, your memories must be far better than mine. Uh, I had to take notes. I, really, I had to take notes. And even now when, uh, you know, if I was meeting uh, a, a prospect. Uh, there's nothing wrong with taking a journal out. And uh, I've only used journals for the last eight years. Um, but actually opening a page, taking a pen out. So would you mind, it's politeness, a bit of professional etiquette. Would you mind if I take a few notes? What's that going to say to the other person? Going to say, this guy, first of all, is professional. And he's really interested. And when he's making notes, I'll tell you a funny story at Melksham, 
uh, Bradford, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was Melksham uh, meeting. And uh, we had a visitor came and uh, she took a notepad out, a yellow legal pad it was, and started to take in notes. She sat next to me and I was quite very impressed with that. So uh, I, I, I mentioned that when I spoke at the end, I mentioned and complimented her on taking notes. I think it's a great idea. So the following week, and I remember it was the NatWest bank manager, is busy for the first time taking notes. And he's bang, 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 bang. And he's looking on bang, bang, bang. He's looking up and he's bang, bang. And he came to him to do his one minute. He picked his notes up and the word, there was his script. So he wasn't listening to anybody. He was writing out what he was about to say because he had not prepared it. So you've got to be careful about taking notes. But if there's a sequence of information you need, uh, then until you... So to have those notes available. And the other point I made was um, on social. Social nowadays, a lot of people are looking to make connections on something like LinkedIn or Facebook, et cetera. The real activity comes when you PM somebody, when you take somebody off that open conversation. So knowing, uh, knowing how to do that and taking them off, you can have that conversation uh, two way about asking questions that are just gathering information. And that is a, a, a key point. Uh, one of the strategies that uh, I've started to use in, in the other side of my business is actually, uh, I put a post up on Facebook. It was merely a photograph of myself as saying that I don't, you know, I've got 600 people on Facebook. Uh, very often I don't hear from many, many people uh, because of the algorithms. Uh, so uh, if you see this post, just say, just say hi or, or, or whatever, and uh, then I can re-engage. And I've done that, and it's, I've got about 260 people responding now. They all of a sudden are technically maybe leads, you might argue. Um, but of course, in a few of those cases, I've started conversations. And I've had some really good Zoom calls with people I haven't seen uh, for absolutely ages to catch up. They've not been sales calls. They've just been conversations that have turned into a Zoom call. I've got one today from the general manager of Weller in Italy, Amins Verga, he lives in Milan. He's one of those very handsome Italians. Uh, and we, we, it must be 25 years since we've last spoken. He was general manager of Italy, I was general manager of the UK. And I've got a call at three o'clock today and it won't be about anything else but just catching up. Because when you have a conversation, you find out what's happening in their lives, you know, what are you doing right now? What have you got planned? <coughs> you know, I, they're, the, they're the sort of questions that, that, that we can do, but they're done offline. So there's a very good lead generation approach that can be made, but it's all that we can make, but it's all born around being interested in where they're up to and where they're going. Ollie, you had a point. Um, yeah, I'll just going to pick up on what you said about taking um, a notebook with you. Um, I had a couple of meetings last week with clients and took my kind of journal with me and none of the clients had anything and they all sort of sat there and were like, oh, we really should have taken some notes or um, a notebook with us. And it just reminds me of when you're out for dinner, say, and um, the waiter or waitress comes over and you occasionally get it where they don't write it down and you think, am I actually going to get what on earth it was I ordered? And I think it creates that probably that same kind of um, worry in with clients. If you don't make notes about things, if you think you're going to, and, you know, none of us can remember everything at once. And um, yeah, so yeah, it definitely works kind of taking a notebook and shows that you're, um, yeah, interested, professional, and you are kind of really going to action what they've said, really. And it could be that you, in part of your follow-up, Ollie, from mm -hmm. your notes, you actually just put the highlights of the things that you've agreed or the things that they need to be watching out for in the future. And um, that is, again, another little professional touch. Rebecca? I was, I was actually going to say just that, <clears throat> almost like giving them the minutes of the meeting, because that's it's a nice way just to confirm you've, you've heard what they've said and useful for them. Or if you find that a lot, especially with um, sole traders and small businesses, if they do seem a bit kind of, in a way, they kind of haven't got a clue, is maybe go to the meeting with a sheet of what you do or, you know, something outlining or some useful tips or something. 
and say, oh, look, you could have this. You could write on the back if you want. I have a spare pen. <laughs> and then they've got sort of, you know, you on one side and then your conversation on the other could be. That's, yeah, that's a really good idea. A bit um, where we used to, used to give notepads to clients and things like that. And I oh, think, yeah, yeah it's, it's that kind of, like I say, it's got a good um, reminder of who you are and what you do, but it's also, they can use it. And yeah, it's good. good yeah. Idea. This note business is very useful. Remember, when you're doing a one-to-one -one with somebody, whether it's on, so you notice I've got a pen and I'm writing things down here as people are saying things. Um, when you're doing a one-to-one -one with somebody, when we're back to live or even on Zoom, uh, actually taking a note shows the other person, again, you're interested. You're trying to, you're trying to build some understanding. Your memory's not that good. Um, I think it was Mel first and then Anne-Marie. Yeah, and in the, the good old agency days, we, it was essential that during the meeting, we produced what we called a contact report. And following the meeting, this was supplied to the client and it had who'd said what, who was doing what, what the actions were, and who was responsible for delivering those actions. And they were essential that nothing was missed and the client was happy with the result of the meeting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's got Anne Marie and then Andrew and then Marcus. And, and just while I, I think on that, in in any relationship, remember if it's eight, if it's um, uh, eighty two percent sales touch, you want to open up. What is the next step? When will you call? You know, when we will we meet again, or when will we discuss again? But even if you think you've lost the sale or the timing's not right, uh, I always always say uh, I'd love to stay in touch. Is that okay with you? Uh, I don't use the word follow up uh, because that's an implication that you're going to, uh, to me, it's got implications. I just say, is it okay if we stay in touch? Love to stay in touch with you. Nobody's ever said no. And that gives you the excuse. And then your diary forward. That's part of that process of the seven touches, if you like. It's not bombarding them with lots of information. Hopefully, they're seeing your name and from from variety of content that you're doing. Now, I've slightly lost it for once. Who was first? It was... Anne Marie, was it? And then Andrew and then Marcus. Sorry if I've got that slightly out of order. Anne Marie. That's what I was just going to say really, really quickly. Um, I have designed two very, very simple Google Forms, um, which have got very basic, you know, information on who I've met, what we've discussed, what the outcomes were, just really. And I'm now sending those to everybody, emailing that to everybody after a one to one. And I did, I started doing it for my own personal use because I was finding that I was forgetting where I was at and who I was saying what to and what we'd agreed and timescales. But actually, the more I do it, the more I think it's a really useful exercise because it does add that extra bit of professionalism. And it's nothing, it's nothing fancy. It's got obviously the logo and everything on it. And it just says, you know, thanks ever so much or whatever. But it, it just, I'm just finding that's quite beneficial because then people they also know as well, rather than just kind of walking away from a one-to-one -one and going, well, that was fun, but what next? That you've got that piece of information that tells them what's next. Um, so it was it, like literally really simple. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. I think that's, that's, that's quite important. And in fact, um, a good strategy for refer, when you're talking to referral partners is to have a document uh, that that highlights the the key things that they might need to know. You know your backstory, uh, typical clients you work with, exactly who you want to work with, what sort of how you help them. A couple of testimonials. Have that printed out, uh, but actually have a blank version so you can say, look, and you start with them, um, and you say, look, these are the. Uh, these are the questions I want to ask and I want to get to know how I can help you get more business. So you start to fill those details in. It gives you a guide to that. And then in return, you give them uh, maybe a blank sheet and they, they fill in that. And just in case you forget, you, you can look at yours as a crib sheet uh, and then even hand it to them. So they've got that. So you're cementing that communication. Um, was it Marcus next? Um, no, I think. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Sorry. No, sorry. I guess, I guess so we've both of you haven't really spoken. So, Andrew. 
Okay, sure. Um, I was just going to say that every time I meet with a prospect, I always take notes. And then what I do, those notes form the basis of my proposal that I then send them. So that's quite a good way of then cementing what we've discussed, some of the suggestions we've made, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see those. And then quite often that will, they'll either sort of green light that or they'll come back and say, oh, you know, how about this or whatever. So that's quite a good method I find to actually form a base of a, of a proposal, making notes for the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And 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 they are at the centre of the whole conversation. I think that, that, that's really key. Uh, Marcus? A counter argument on notes. When I, when I was a lecturer, I used to say to my students not to take notes because when you take notes, it's very easy to go back after the lesson and just close them up and forget about it. And I used to say to them, it's best that they just, even if they only remember one or two things from the lesson, it's better that that's a, a better engagement. Having said that, though, I am taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you being a, a, an actual lecturer, uh, I will bow. I will bow to your uh, superior knowledge. However, uh, I would say that uh, people are. They say that if you make a goal and you write it down, you're more likely to achieve it. It's the writing down is the engagement. And if somebody's taking, uh, if somebody's not taking notes, I, I I just can't see what they they might pick up on one or two. But I, I would always, at the end of a workshop, just say, oh, the end of a BNI meeting, in fact, I'd say, for those of you taking notes, just circle one or two of the things that are most important to you. And that's what I would do. So I would take busy notes and I would, as I'm going along, I'm circling certain things and they're my follow-ups. They're the things I'm going to take out of it or the most important part. So it's a bit of both there, Marcus. Yes, I think in a sales environment, it's, a di it's an unusual situation in some ways, isn't it? I mean, what we're talking about here, this whole conversation is something that is, it, it's um, a, a contract almost that is being made, isn't it, between two, pe between two different parties. Well, we are in a sales situation. Yes, that's what I'm saying, yeah. You know? Uh, Nick? I'm just thinking, I've had some um, client conversations which may have taken a year and a half from initial contact, or even two years, from initial contact to close. And, and during those conversations, I might have talked to them two or three times, and I've kept, sometimes I've kept notes about not just the, the actual kind of technical content, but the people that they might have referred to. You know, there could be like seven or eight names mentioned in the client conversation. And actually, a year and a half later, there's no way I, I would remember all those names. So just having a record of everyone that's been involved in the conversation, I can then kind of draw on those details a year and a half later and still feel connected with them. Um, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but I certainly couldn't remember 10 names from a, from a random company two years later. So I, it just kind of helps that kind of per, that personal relationship, I think, and it makes it feel very, yeah, hopefully genuine because you've actually taken a real interest in everyone that's connected. Well, to, I'll give you an example. Um, when I've been doing the qualification in the, when we, uh, in the funeral uh, marketing business that that uh, you and Rod and I have, um, I would take would generate the call through pay per click or generate generate the inquiry. We'd qualify in the inquiry because there's a video that pre qualifies. It tells people what we're looking for and what we're not looking for. So the so when I get the lead through when they fill the details, I pick the phone up and I make notes and I enter those notes in the CRM. Now, um, we've got a call on tonight, a um, little bit like this. We've realized that we need to stay engaged with these people. Uh, we need to keep them qualified. And uh, I've put the word out. And I think there's nine, maybe nine of us on there, uh, seven of which are, are, are actually leads. Uh, I can't remember who's who, but I, I've got my notes in my CRM system. They'll be all printed off. I will ask them to introduce themselves, but I'll, I'll at least be able to start the conversation in the Zoom call as if I really know them very well because of their notes. And I think the busier you get, the more important that becomes, doesn't it? Because it is absolutely, you don't want to get people's names wrong. <laughs> it's absolutely important because what we really ought to be looking at with what we've discussed today is once we've perfected this and we've developed these skills, 
it's all very well if you've just got two a couple of people to talk to in a week, new people. But what we really want to do is we want to be bringing a lot of people, uh, more than we think we can handle. I can't say what that is, but more than we can think we, we can handle. Um, it's interesting. I mean, how many new, how many leads are we reaching out to each week? How many people do, have, do, have we got a target each of us? Because at the moment I'm, I'm looking to reach out to make contact with 25 people on the weight side, weight management side for men. So I'm looking for 25. Now I've got to think to myself, 25, how am I going to do that? Now they're not, I'm not speaking to 25. Uh, I'm thinking, well, will 25 get me five Zoom calls? And will five Zoom calls get me one person on the program? Uh, I don't know yet because I haven't got the stats, but I've got to, I've got to begin somewhere. Uh, and once I've got the system, because I know what I want to achieve, um, I might say, well, this really isn't enough. I've got to bring more people through. So we've got to have some sort of process. And frankly, I don't think I can, it can't be a case of writing down every time. It's got to be really qualifying quite hard. So uh, was it Anne-Marie and then was it Ollie as well? No, it was Rod. Rod was first and then Anne-Marie. Oh, thank you very much. Age before beauty, eh? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think, I think the, for, for me, um, the pivotal part of my week, and I avoid a Wednesday for a funeral unless I'm a death, definitely wants one, um, is the market. And um, engaging with people on the market, I think is very easy. You know, I, I just engage with people. And then, of course, most of the people that walk by me are in my target audience, merely because it's a Wednesday and they're not working. So it's fairly straightforward for me. So that becomes easy. But I don't talk to them about funerals unless they ask me. I don't talk to them about funeral plans unless they ask me. I'm dealing with from a position of strength, not from a position of weakness. If I don't, my view is I'm there for, I don't know, five hours. In that five hours, I'll be seen by more people than any of us on this call can hope to achieve probably in six months. Now, if I can engage with some of them sometimes, great. Um, but by being there, they've seen me. They're aware of what I do. They're aware of the business I'm in. I've achieved my goal. My, my other market traders, when I first came on the market, were worried about how was I ever going to make any money? <laughs> and, and that wasn't what I was there for. You know? and, also, and also, I think, because you're a, a jolly person, because you're always smiling and, and laughing, you're approachable and you and you've suddenly you've suddenly uh, disrupted their perception of a funeral director and i'm sure that's a lot of that and marie yeah kind of a question um really so one of the things that i i have just recently done is i've launched what i've called a covid stories project so i'm putting 19 people's lockdown stories together from all different walks of life so that we can reflect on it and we can see how the challenges you know the good and the bad and the ugly basically and in order to find those 19 people um i reached out to my network on linkedin and bni um and said you know i need this person that person the other person i have been inundated with people um, they are the only referrals I've had from BNI is people saying, oh, this person wants to be in your book, blah, 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 which is brilliant because it means I've now got more than 19 and I've got to try and cut it down. But it's actually shown me that something like that has engaged people, whereas what I was doing previously, I would never have got all of those people. So it's then a question of, well, Potentially, I could work with some of those to look at developing their stories more and then, you know, persuading them they want to write a book. But how do I how do I go from something that I've put together as a charity project because the proceeds are going to go to the NHS? You know, that's worked brilliantly, but my normal marketing doesn't. Does, so I'm, I'm kind of like, well, it's a bit like people want to do things for nothing. There will be a lot of people that, that want to do no, uh, want something for nothing. There's a, there's a lot of people. You've just got to accept that as the status quo. Um, and you've got to consider what value they get for nothing. And does that solve their issues? And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer straight off for that. No, um, but it's, 
So certainly, I think if you, I think the idea of producing as a promotion, it's almost like a challenge of getting everybody's COVID stories in. Um, I'd pick up on that. I'd have in the back of that book that everybody's got a story to tell. Um, and it could be a story to tell their grandchildren. It's a story they want telling. It's a story, it could be a story that is difficult to tell. Um, but I help people bring out their stories and sometimes to help produce it into a book, into a part of a presentation. See, I happen to think that the big book bit gets slightly in the way. And I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, that shouldn't mean that you go and redesign everything, but if we were talking beforehand, I think the book would get in the way of what you're really doing. You see, a lot of people don't have the confidence to produce a book. They don't have, think there's a book in them. But we've all got stories, and stories are an easier first step. If you, you know, what's your backstory? You know, you listen to Rod's backstory. Good. This, this is like a, there's three volumes there. All right. So once you've got that moving and, you know, you've got a story to tell, there's a book in you. Can you see where I'm coming from, from that, that sequence? Now that might be the sequence you cover. Um, that's, that's all. I don't know if anybody else would th think that. I don't know. Andy was nodding or. or I, I think, I think what I would say to Amory is that you've engaged those people. You've now got an opportunity to work alongside them or with them. Um, they will gain confidence in what you have to say and how you're dealing with it. And it's this first step in the journey of working with that particular person. It may not be now. It may be in six months' time. It may be in a year's time. But it, they're going to know you more than they know you now. And they're going to build the confidence in what you have to say within the story that you're relating with that particular person. And so even if they don't use you, they can at least say, well, I know someone who could really do the job first class. So all of a sudden, you've increased your network by tenfold. You certainly need something in the back of that book along the lines of what I just said, because what are those people in the COVID story is going to do, they're going to share that. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, it, there is kind of a marketing element to it, because I'm yeah. hoping that their, their family and friends will want to buy it. Each contributor I'm, uh, are going to put their own paragraph in. Um, they're going to, you know, they can put their dedications and stuff. So it, it's their personal story with their thanks and acknowledgements and whatever. So they they will hopefully want to show it to family and friends and so on and so on. Um, so it, it's marketing from the point of view of growing, hopefully growing my exposure um, because it's not a money making thing. Yeah. Um, I need to cover my costs, but beyond that. Have you got this? Game, yeah, have you got this running on social media? Did you say? Um, no, not not yet. Only my shout outs. So it's now sitting on the website, and I'm in the process of um, doing the interviews and starting to pull the stories together. Um, because what you've just done there is a great challenge to put out. You'd get a lot of uh, you get some really good thread on that you get some real traction i would think if you put that out on facebook you know what is your story about covid you know um i think rebecca and then nick yeah i was just wondering whether i wonder what appealed to people whether it was the idea of contributing a small part to a greater whole and maybe that's something that you could apply in other, like, instead of one person in a family writing a book, you could have, like, stories from all the family about the family put into one book or something. Yeah. Just thinking, because you were surprised by how popular oh. the reaction was. So yeah, exactly. is it is it that, or is it just because it. it's a historical... I don't... I, I, some of it, I think people want to be heard. Yeah. And I think that's... So, uh, because I've gone for a cross-section... Um, so I've got people like we're first time mums and, you know, all of the, the various different elements. I've got an NHS worker, I've got a non, you know, non NHS key yeah. worker, people that will have been experiencing very, very different things. Mm. A lot of people have got a lot to say. And I think it's the opportunity to be heard. Mm. Um, as soon as I approached, you know, when people started coming in and I started having conversations with them. Oh, yeah, I need to say this. And I need to say this. And, I need, and it was almost like there's all this stuff that they need to just verbalize mm. so I think that's 
possibly where it's come from, where people have felt unrepresented or unheard or whatever during the whole of the process. But We're just pissed off. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think this is particularly valuable, Anne-Marie, because mm. uh, what it would do is it would... It, would, it kind of brings people together, while, whereas media and social media is tearing people apart. We're taking a stance of mass wearers, non-mass wearers, etc. We're making judgments. And I think for people to understand the human side of, of how it's affected, it affects different people different ways, that we can't see. Yeah. You know, I, had somebody, I, I had somebody on uh, a local community uh, site that's saying anybody that's... Uh, still going into uh, places without the mask uh, is, is, and I can't remember what she said, but, you know, straight away defended her uh, because how dare she make judgments about people that are not wearing, choose not to wear a mask uh, any more than anybody should make a judgment about somebody that is wearing a mask because you don't know why they're not, why they're doing that. Uh, so we've got this division. I think you that would bring people together and uh, especially people, well, it, and, and it makes people understand one another a bit better. And that's, there's a lot of misunderstanding with people right now. Now I've forgotten who was next. Was it Nick? Yeah, no, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, Anne-Marie, once your book is published, whether there's an opportunity to try and get some editorial features around some of the content. There's a lot, you often see with, with books where elements of pub, you know, excerpts are published from the book and it could be for example if you had an NHS story there might be an NHS magazine that would be interested in running just an excerpt on one of the elements of your book or so you could take maybe different snapshots and think oh, actually I could target a series of magazines that might be interested in some of the content and that could then really raise the profile of the book yeah or, or just you as an Ooh, author what about portraits of the people <laughs> exactly <laughs> I know well, three I... photographers that would be happy to help <laughs> I, That'd be I, awesome I, though, really great, like even black and white, make them all black and white so it all looks the same or, yeah. or something, <laughs> or completely different. Now I've just picked up on one here, Anne-Marie, I've written down. Uh, last week, uh, I'm no longer in the Lions, I was in, in there for I think three years and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And of course I take lots of photographs, so just a week ago, the president of the Lions has asked me to um, for permission to carry on using the photographs that I've done, and whether it's the boat race, some video, etc., uh, because they want to have an archive. Because the Lions in Wells is forty-five years old, um, and that's a story to be told. I know it's a story they want to tell. They'd like before lockdown that they, they were wanting to have an exhibition in the town hall about the lions and remember there's a lot of people in wells were ex-lions and you know the things that they did and the, they had it's a knockout years ago and noel edmonds flew in by helicopter and all those things right now a lot of people would enjoy that so creating a story of that that could mm. be really good now the lions don't have all their money goes to local charities but of course somebody in the lions could sponsor that at the back a book uh, that people then could buy for charity or or whatever. That could be a good fundraiser. Somebody could sponsor your cost at the back with their details. Just yeah. saying, Rod. I mean, there's an idea. But it not just the Lions. There are other organisations that are long-standing that that have a story to tell for the community. So your idea there that could be a good one to pursue. Mm. Yeah, thank you. No, that's a that is a really good idea. You might, you might want to, Rod. You might want to propose that. Well, you never know. I mean, I think the thing is that the the um, the essence of it is that you, you you build your business around your life. You build your life around your business. You live your business. You live your life. And so, consequently, you get involved in charity. You, you, you're interested in that. But there is obviously got to be a business element in it, and there certainly is for me within the Lions. You know. And then you get, you know, staff stuff like this weekend, me turning from uh, a funeral director, undertaker, to um, executioner, you know, being Jack Ketch and having all that fun wandering around the marketplace on a fun day in Wales. It, you know, oh, it's yeah. important to be that person that they go to, isn't it? That, that you know, I was, I was uh, devastated by the funeral that walked past my flat on Friday of last week. 
There was hundreds and hundreds of people uh, for this poor lady that had died of cancer, only 50. And my uh, direct competition had got it. And I, the first thing I thought was, why would you run down the road as a funeral director in front of a procession with 200 people? I'd be slow marching. I'd take all day to get to the church, mate, you know. But um, uh, I shouldn't have uh, been so critical, really. It was naughty and nasty of me. But I couldn't help it because I just thought I could do it so much better. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in the community site, I'll share the video of Rod, Rod's performance today. Very good history lesson as well. And I don't know whether you know about it, but the de that, ex that execution day was the 23rd of September, 1685. 23, Rod, did you know that? 23, I did know that. <laughs> there you go, there you go. I want to remember. ask, I, 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 this conversation's gone on very well, and I really wanted to get some time just to ask a very shortened version of how I would do this, when I, how I go about this. And I want to pick on Andy. Um, and uh, Andy, I just want to ask you a few questions uh, to see how I can better serve you within this environment. Uh, I do know that you've, uh, that probably you belong to other networking meetings and you also um, uh, have used different marketing consultants, et cetera. What is, what is, persuaded you to be part of this particular community? Mainly a couple of its existing members, i.e. Nick and Chris. Yeah. Um, and sorry, better not leave. Well, half of the membership, basically, I network with in one element or another. Um, and I was getting quite a lot of feedback from them. And yes, they are marketing professionals, but it seemed to be that, you know, for me as a business owner, I have a good idea of what I want to do. I just need a little bit of guidance with it. So it just seems, you know, the, the perfect thing for me, really. Yeah. Well, I, I tended to assume that because I know that you've done some work with Nick Sladek. So you were searching yeah. for something. What is it, when you say guidance, what do you mean by guidance? I mean, you, how long have you been in business, by the way? Um, end of this year, it'd be four years. So four years. Yeah. Would you consider it to be, be successful? I wouldn't change it, let's put it that way. There have been well, some trials and tribulations, shall we say, within that four years. Yeah, yeah. Um, COVID, one of them, cancer being another one. Um, but no, yeah, it's the way I do business and the feedback I get from my customers, it, yeah, I wouldn't change it. it. There is, yeah. So you get a lot of satisfaction out of it. And, yeah, it's uh, not just in, the money. You've I survived. Relationships. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you haven't had to go back and get a job or whatever, uh, right. I could go, if I had more time, I'd go into... It came very close at one point. Well, I think... Lockdown, but, yeah, no, no. You say that for all of us, I think, yeah. if we were all really honest. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd probably spend a bit more time if I was meeting Andy for the first time, mm -hmm. and I had more time here, uh, on Backstory, you know, what got him into that, what did he do previously? But I'm particularly interested about the, what, what you said, that maybe you're looking for a bit more guidance. I suspect that with looking for... So what part of your marketing is, do you need more guidance on? What are you not... What would you like more of? Is it more leads? Is it better conversion? What? Joining... It's, it's probably it's probably a broader idea of... Uh, a broader oversight of maybe where to focus on my marketing. Right. Um, at the moment, I get most of my leads from referrals or repeats. Um, and those come pre-packaged generally because they, the person that they come from knows how I work. So therefore, they've already basically filtered that information down to who they're referring in most cases. Um, so they've all, in some ways, screened out some of the people that aren't suitable for me. Right. Uh, what I would like is, is I'm getting, I don't need a huge number of inquiries, is the honest answer, Paul. What I looking for realistically um, is somewhere between 50 to 100 leads of a mixed quality a month that will filter down to give me where I want to be. Right. If you had 100 leads, mm. uh, reasonable leads, what yeah. percentage of those would turn into business? Probably 25. Yeah. So 25 percent. Yeah. That's good. I'm not asking you now, but do you know the short-term value of those leads? In most cases, would be by the time you take them at cost, etc., probably around about four to five hundred pounds. Yeah. 
Right. So there's quite a bit of business. Is that yeah. is that um, is that immediate business or long term value over the over the value of the lease? Um, it's mostly immediate, but there is a an ongoing um, element of it. It trickles through as well. So yeah. So probably ninety percent of that is up front, and then a small portion of it is is through the life of the contract. Yep. So. Right. So. So at least you, if you're generating that, you're generating enough money to put a proportion of that into actual lead generation yeah. campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of people go and go the referral route. Mm. Because frankly, it's a perception that there's no cost to it. There is a cost. But there is. There's the energy of networking and those yeah. other elements, yeah. And, and people used to say, well, I've got to value my cost at one and a half hours. Well, I used to say to people, you'd probably be asleep anyway. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, are you doing, so is your, is your main source, are you doing any, what are the, re, what are the marketing sources are you doing? Uh, well, in the moment, basically it's through networking, um, a, a very soft campaign of cold calling through LinkedIn. That, I'd call that networking again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is it at the moment, to be fair, Paul. I mean, and, yeah. And the referrals you get from that source, yeah. it's been very successful. How many people are giving you that business? It is a bit like Pareto's list, to be fair. It is about 20% of them. Yeah, yeah. So, 20% so, of, of my customers give me 80% of my business. Yeah, yeah. Not far wrong from that, actually. Yeah. So is there anybody specifically from a networking event that's giving you, I don't know the name, I don't um, know the name. Have you got two strong referral I've got three, three or four, four super fans, yeah. So Three or four. Yeah. yeah. So one route could be if you got six or eight referral mm. fans, there's that, that could be something you'd search for. Yeah. But the other thing that could be worth exploring is uh, pay-per-click. Uh, done it done with somebody yeah. who knows what they're doing yeah. um because that could because so it's because it sounds like the bit that we really want to capture to begin with is getting more of those leads coming through qualified leads yes that's the yeah. thing i mean I, the reason i step back for it a couple of times is through the socials um facebook ones and they've been a scatter gun and they've been very low value they are purely transactional and I've looked at it and it, they, they weren't the right sort of not the, at the right point or the right people for me, one or the other. Yeah. I haven't defined which yet, but yeah. 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 So the fact that you've tried Facebook mm. is, is good. Very yeah. often people try something, it doesn't work. So they give up on it. They don't think, yeah. well, that's it. Yeah. could it be a bit, should, did I do it right? Did I do mm. it long enough? Uh, yeah. Could I have done it differently? Were my headlines right, etc. So that's when a professional tell you to split yeah. test, etc. And maybe, maybe the person that was helping you, did you do it on your own? Um, I did the first one, yeah. So yeah, yeah well, yeah. most I would imagine most fail because we don't know what we're doing. We think we do. Precisely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's the it, the professional knows the things that so that, that that one should be doing those critical points. So. That's a short time. That's the sort of conversation I have. You'll notice that I asked lots of questions. And even when he said something, I suddenly double checked and went back uh, just to qualify that and to get. So I've got a lot of facts in there in a very short space of time. Uh, again, it's not accepting what Andy said. First of all, I delved a little bit deeper. So um, that's what I wanted to try and get in. Thanks for that, Andy. My recommendation is that we get together uh, yes. to explore how we double your referral partners, how to search those out. That is what I would be looking for. You may think you're just looking for introductions to the uh, to, to lease, car leasing, vehicle leasing, and that's it, yes, but you may be stopping there. I would spend a bit of time and get a strategy together to double the number of referral partners. Yes. You probably then wouldn't need to do any pay-per-click. But no, I'd, that's also, it. I'd be quite happy with that, to be fair. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and as long as you're able to, to to give some feedback to them and help them, they'll probably continue to do it. And it could be yeah. just on pure relationship uh, mm -hmm. or pure understanding. But I definitely get those people. Uh, but also, I'd have a conversation at some point with Ewan. Um, not, you, no, he's not going to be the sort of person that then insists that you go and do a campaign or anything, but yeah. might be able to give some pointers that 
maybe you've helped you in the past. So both of those could be good good means. If I can just quickly, uh, thanks for that, Andy. Uh, so happy to do, let's, let's organize a one-to-one -one for that. I'll give you my diary and then we can sort it out. Uh, just quickly go around, uh, running slightly over time. I do apologize, but I'm relaxed if you are. Marcus, what have you got from, what have you got from today? Yeah, do you know what? My mind kept drifting off uh, towards a Vincent van Gogh, alone in his garret, painting his sunflowers. That, and I thought, what did he lack? What did, why, what did he lack? And I thought, I know what he lacked. He lacked a sales strategy. And that's <laughs> strategy. I, th I thought he was forlorn, but uh, rock. Yeah. Do you know what? That started off, probably. <laughs> started <laughs> off forlorn, but I think... Not just, rely, not just relying on people, like I think I... When I started off, you know, people re coming to me beca because of me, you can't rely on that. You've got to have a strategy behind your sales. You've got to go, um, you've got to go out and get it. Rod? Yeah. Yeah, I think it just reinforced um, all the things that uh, I know that works. You know, at the end of the day, you, you, you've just got to keep on doing what uh, brings you in the business. And, um, uh, you know, going up on the market every Wednesday is a pain in the ass sometimes, especially if it's pouring down with bloody rain or it's freezing cold. But if you're not there, people think you've gone. They th <laughs> think you're deceased. Like, you, like, you're deceased. Yeah, they think they think you're. You know, what's happened to that chap? But it's yeah. like also with you know whether it's whether it's Google um, advertising, you know, pay per click, um, and we know, you know, I know from last week my card had run out. I hadn't realised it. I renewed it, paid off the debt that I owed Google. And what happened on Thursday night last week? Yeah, got a job out of it. Um, and um, just the the ongoing um, awareness campaign with the local voice newspaper, which seems to be taking over the, the local community here. It's a free newspaper. All right, it cost me, I, I spent 150 quid a month, but it's just that awareness it's just that legitimization, putting your face in those pages. People come up to me on the market and say, I'm fed up with seeing you in the bloody paper. <laughs> Great. That, that, that certainly could be. Uh, you know my feelings about that. Uh, 150 quid spent on Google could be producing far more business uh, up front. So I'm not arguing you shouldn't do that. But again, Andy, talking to Rod, because he leases his car, you ought to have a conversation about what he does on Google, you know, um, because that could be that secondary source. Uh, Nick, what have you got from today? Um, oh, God, we covered so much ground, didn't we? I, I think something that jumped out for me, kind of that visibility and awareness and playing the long game. Don't be, don't be too pressured, don't be too rushed, and just build genuine relationships and keep giving value. Yeah. Um, keep it personable, and the business will come over time, I think. The, the, the long game is easier to play when you're constantly bringing a lot more people who... If you're busy, you can play the long game. Or can't urgent you? need to pay your mortgage. Yeah. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I think it just um, reinforces that you've got to be in the room in whatever form that takes, be it on Google, be it networking, whatever you do it, you've got to, you've got to be in the room and it, and it will come. You know, don't force it. When you force yeah. it, it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. You've got to put yourself out there in exactly the right way, which needs thinking about. Ollie. Um, yeah, I think similar to Nick, actually, I think Andy, you might have said it on messages, but um, that being visible, being consistent um, is yeah, really quite a good, good advice. But also the, the lead generation, the um, understanding where the perspective that the lead is now and then where they want to be and then playing my part in how we can get them from a to B kind of thing with it. So that's, yeah, for me. And the more people you've got going through doing that and where you're up to, the more you've got to have a CRM system. You've got to have something that takes you through. You can't rely on just, just the notes. The notes are just temporary for the day. Andy. Well, so many things today, but um, yeah, the, like the thing I put in the, in the chat, you've got to be consistent with what you do and, and, People get that confidence from the fact they do see you over it. I, similar thing to Rod. I have somebody that says, I see you every day on bloody LinkedIn. Good. Yeah, and brilliant. Yeah. Um, so I'll continue doing it. <laughs> and the second one is you're very right, very right, Paul, with a CRM. If I didn't have a CRM, I'd be all over the place. 
of yeah, capturing yeah. all those bits and pieces in one place. Yeah. You've got to have it in one place. If you've got yeah. you know two or three, I mean, you've yeah. you've you, you, you've got that confusion uh, at the start of the day. Thanks, yeah. Andy. Martin. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I've definitely gone from forlorn to a more energetic state at the end of the session. So that's kind of a, a good thing. So, yeah, I think it's uh, basically um, thinking of numbers, higher numbers, approaching them in an intelligent way, in a consistent way, and, and starting to have, I do have a CRM, but I have to use it more, yeah. you know. It's sort of like a habit, always having it open, I think. And that's, I think it's just an ongoing process with myself. So, but yeah, it was good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rebecca? Um, yeah, really useful session. Uh, I think one thing that stuck is what Andy said actually about slowing down that conversation. And I think that's really good just to make your, your potential client kind of just slow down and talk you through it and because sometimes they can be keen like what's your day rate and you know they just want to jump I just need pictures and what's your day rate but trying to break that down and yeah just slow it down and have a good chat and they'll they'll get into it in the end and actually one thing I um I think before and this marketing crew has probably definitely guided me on this before I always had um on a spreadsheet that I use jobs at the beginning um, that was like the first where I'd be starting, but actually now I've got contacts at the beginning and that's, that's where I start. So that's my first page in the day, I guess a bit CRM, but my own at the moment till I decide, but, but that's definitely where I'm focusing relationships. Who are they? What can I give them? How can I help? I think also what, when Andy answered that question about how many leads he needs in a week and how many he converts, he's got some historical data. Very often mm -hmm. we haven't got that historical data, so we've got to make a jab at that. And and uh, Martin just said about um, you know his list of contacts and increasing them. Sometimes and um, we tend to increase them to an area we're comfortable with. Um, what I've been taught is to try and get over that to a level we're not uncomfortable, we're, we're slightly uncomfortable with, because that allows you get to a stage there where you really don't mind if people are not interested right now. Because, yeah. you know, uh, Anne Marie. Um, yeah, everything um, today always obviously brilliant. Quick um, thing to Andy, I've just looked at your website and my next car that I want is an electric car. So I've clicked on electric and obviously you've got them all beautifully laid out and I can see that the cheapest one is X amount. However, and this might be somewhere and this might be me being really thick, you don't tell me anywhere what I need in order to have an electric car because I know I need an external point, but I have no idea what I need, how I need it, where to get it from, how I get it installed, how much it is. So as a user, I'm kind of like, you've only given me half the information. So I don't know whether that's no. don't know whether that's useful or whether that's just me being really thick, but I've come away going, I'd like to work with you, but I, I don't know what else I need to do. No, no, you've you're bang on Anne Marie. There is a couple of things I'm working on, um, but I need a few elements in it before we then load it up. But yeah, so that is that is the plan. Yeah, thank you. Oh brilliant. Thank you. Great stuff. I don't know whether uh, Chris is able to give us any feedback um, because there's a blank screen there and there's a red dot. But if he isn't, if he doesn't rather, um, and I know he was catching much of this. Um, thank you very much to everybody. I hope you have a really great week and uh, plenty of leads. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing you again soon. All the best. I'll send you a link, Andy. All the best. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good week, everyone.